Last week, the Supreme Court reversed a century of law that I believe will open the floodgates for special interests, including foreign corporations, to spend without limit in our elections. I don't think American elections should be bankrolled by America's most powerful interests, or worse, by foreign entities. They should be decided by the American people. And I'd urge Democrats and Republicans to pass a bill that helps correct some of these problems. Have you noticed something strange about our elections since 2010? We had the biggest flood of corporate money in American history into our elections, and with it has come huge wins for candidates who favor big corporations. Get ready for a tsunami in 2012. Big money is going to drown out the voices of we the people. So what broke the dam? The answer is the Supreme Court of the United States. More specifically, it's 5-4 decision on January 21st, 2010, in the case of Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission. Here's what happened. In 2008, Citizens United wanted to show its anti-Hillary film a video on-demand offering just before the 2008 primary. Federal Election Commission said in effect, sorry, we have a law against that. The issue is one of timing. The law forbids you spending corporate treasury funds to broadcast an electioneering ad shortly before any federal election. Citizens United sued and the case worked its way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. Two years later, on January 21, 2010, in a 5 to 4 ruling, the Supreme Court ruled that a corporation has a First Amendment right to speak through unlimited monetary contributions. In other words, the Supreme Court decision means that a constitution protects a corporation's right to speak with money just as it protects the right of any individual American to speak freely. The floodgates are open. How did we get into this situation and what can we do about it? In order to help us answer that question, we're pleased to have with us Professor Jim Allison. He and his wife have researched corporate personhood's checkered history and its chilling effect on our democracy. Dr. Allison is a professor emeritus at Indiana University. He's been studying a landmark Supreme Court decision made in 1886 that paved the way for the 2010 Supreme Court decision. That decision, the Santa Clara Railroad Tax Decision, was the first brick placed in the monument to corporate personhood. Dr. Allison, thank you for being with us today. It's great to be here. What was a corporation back in the early days of our founders? To the founders of the United States, the answer was simple and clear. A corporation was an artificial creature of law, subservient to the state, with no other rights than its charter said it had, or that it required to complete its purpose, to make a road, a bridge, a building. It had special privileges, such as limited liability, but no constitutional rights. Actually, most state charters expired after 10 or 20 years and had to be renewed. And the state could, and sometimes did, revoke the charter of a corporation found to not be acting in the public interest. The inalienable rights listed in the Bill of Rights were always viewed as the rights of American persons, period. Free speech, religion, assembly, and all the others were personal rights, not corporate rights. And if corporations were going to have special privileges that helped them become rich and powerful, then government had to regulate them with scrupulous care. And so, like Moth the Flame, the United States Supreme Court was drawn into the task of regulation. 
and began to build a huge body of constitutional case law on corporations. But all of that case law was suddenly overturned with the 1886 Santa Clara decision. This was the Chief Justice at the time. If he were alive today, we the people could ask him what happened in 1886 and try him on our people's court of public opinion. <laughs> I'll give an early example. In 1839, in the case of the Bank of Augusta versus Earl, the Supreme Court ruled that corporations might be treated as citizens in federal court so as to hold them accountable for wrongs, but could not claim the constitutional rights of living persons. And so it went in case after case, decade after decade, as it should have continued, except that corruption changed the game plan in 1886. You're out of order. My name is Morrison Remick Waite, Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, 1874-1888. I was educated at Yale, Phi Beta Kappa, Skull and Bones, and I practiced law in Ohio often in defense of railroads and big corporations. And why not? Railroads in those days were the shapers of cities, the bringers of dreams, modernizers, and wealth builders. It's true I had no judicial experience before President Grant appointed me Chief Justice, and that I was not his first choice. In fact, I was his seventh choice. Many were dubious at first, but I proved them wrong. Soon I became known as a quick study, honest and industrious to a fault, and a popular figure. I served until my sudden, unexpected death in 1888. And I can tell you that my ruling in Santa Clara was completely correct and legally unassailable. And we are grateful for your service, Judge Waite. But I must disagree with you. Let me explain. As I was saying, we had all that standing case law establishing that corporations should not have the constitutional rights of human persons from the birth of the Republic right up through 1860 and long beyond. But then something odd happened in the 1880s, and it happened because of two results of the Civil War. What were they? First, the Civil War made railroads richer than God. Now they could get the very best lawyers, rented by the ton, to help them fight the enemy of expediency, government regulation. It was all perfectly legal. Of course it was. Second, the Civil War inspired Congress to write the 14th Amendment in defense of the human rights of newly freed slaves. A good idea, but hard as hell to get approved. Ratified in 1868, the 14th Amendment was supposed to protect freed slaves from abuse by Southern legislatures. This is what it says in Section 1, which speaks famously about due process and equal protection. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. Can anyone doubt that the words of the 14th Amendment were meant to protect people, the recently freed slaves from Southern legislatures? It is hard to imagine how a defender of original intent like Justice Scalia can claim 14th Amendment protections for corporations. Quite apart from the plight of freed slaves, those clever corporate lawyers saw the 14th Amendment as simply a handy weapon in the fight against regulation if they could just persuade the courts to declare that corporations were persons, then corporations could evade state regulation under 14th Amendment protections, the same protections that any natural person, except a woman, of course, or a freed slave, could claim against state laws. This new kind of legal assault began right away in 1869. Hundreds of cases were brought to the court, few of them by people. Tom Roy, one of the great constitutional scholars in our country. 
You were a counsel on the San Mateo case. You were on this Santa Clara case. How do we use this to get the rights established for the railroads? Well, Stephen, in settled jurisprudence, Article 4 of the Constitution and the 14th Amendment, citizen or person is used to mean natural persons only. Corporations are not included within their protections. But as you are determined to pursue it, this case does provide another chance. Here are my case notes with some suggestions. The 14th Amendment may prove to be the only bulwark and safeguard by which to protect the great railroad systems of the country against the spirit of communism, which is everywhere threatening their destruction or confiscation. But the Supreme Court continued to reject the corporate claim to 14th Amendment protections. It did so as late as 1880 when it upheld a state's right to ban lotteries in Stone versus Mississippi. Isn't that right, Judge Waite? You became Chief Justice in 1874. So how did you vote in Stone versus Mississippi? Well, well yes, but that, that was an entirely different matter. Don't bother. I looked it up. You not only concurred, you wrote the majority opinion. Your opinion even quoted Chief Justice Marshall. The framers of the Constitution did not intend to restrain states in the regulation of their civil institutions adopted for internal government. And the instrument they give, have given us is not to be so construed. You may sit down, Mr. Waite. Any more on this subject and, and you will be in contempt of court. Mr. Waite, this is not your court. This is the court of public opinion where free speech is the order of the day. <laughs> Well, now comes the great puzzle. Why did the court suddenly do an about face on the momentous question of corporate personhood? Were you culpable, Judge Waite, as Chief Justice? In 1886, on a simple property tax case, the railroads hired guns got their opportunity in Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad case. This was a simple tax case about fences built along Southern Pacific's rails. It had nothing to do with corporate personhood, and yet almost any professor of constitutional law will tell you that this case was the precedent for corporate personhood. Ladies and gentlemen, it was that precedent in 1886 that eventually gave corporations the constitutional protections Congress meant for freed slaves when it wrote the 14th Amendment, and the constitutional rights that were intended by our founders for individual Americans, for we the people, those of us who are human persons, that is. It was this 1886 precedent that created the legal foundation for rights that enabled today's owners of corporations to break free of regulation, avoid the monitoring of environmental protection agencies, and acquire the vast economic power that dominates our government and permeates our culture. In 1886, corporations usurped the rights of individual human persons. They have used those rights against us time and time again. Indeed, it was that precedent that gave us the Citizens United Supreme Court case in the year 2010. And you, Chief Justice Waite, were part of that theft. Wasn't it your decision in Santa Clara versus Southern Pacific that established the precedent of corporate personhood? Absolutely not! I did nothing wrong! That was not our decision at all. Go back to school, Professor, and learn a little more court history before you slander me! Just a moment, Your Honor. What about that famous quote of yours? It's here in a note to you from John Chandler Bancroft Davis, your court reporter in that case. It's probably no accident that Davis was a former railroad president. Well, let me refresh your memory, Chief Justice. It's dated May 25, 1886. Yes, Davis, I believe we struck on a way to, to get the rights for our railroads. You can write it in the head notes. Wait, wait, raised a corporate person question in conference. But you were there. We all assented. Ah, put it in the head notes. 
So you believe that will get the 14th Amendment's application to corporations into the legal record? Yes, I think it shall do quite nicely. After all, the railroads and big business are building this country. They need all the help they can get. All right. I will write to wait for his concurrence. It is important that our railroads gain the rights. I fear the Lord may consign me to hell for such a remarkable falsehood. <laughs> what Lord? Good point. <laughs> oh yes, Davis says no, but, but, but that was just my passing comment. Not, not part of the opinion. I, I think I told Davis it was an accurate statement of what was said in conference before the argument began. But, but the case did not meet the constitutional question. I left it to his discretion as I was busy with other cases. You mean to say that your opinion in Santa Clara settled no constitutional question? That's exactly what I mean. We ruled in favor of Southern Pacific Railroad, but very narrowly on the question of taxes. Justice Harlan wrote the majority opinion. We found that Santa Clara County had made a trivial mistake in figuring the taxes owed by the railroad. It included some fences by mistake, and that was that. We made no ruling on corporate personhood. We all knew that. Court reporter Davis knew it too, but he chose to add that bit about 14th Amendment protections for corporations into his head notes on the case. Excuse me, Your Honor. What are headnotes? Headnotes? Well, headnotes are... Well, the court reporter writes up a kind of summary that lawyers find handy if they're too busy or too lazy to read the official opinion and the decision. And, and, and the decision. This is called a headnote. It carries no legal weight whatsoever. It's the work of the reporter. It's not the work of the court. Everybody ought to know that! And long after your time, the court made it official in 1906 in the Detroit Timber case when it ruled exactly that. Head notes were the work of the court reporter and not the court. Just so. So, you are saying that Bancroft Davis's notes were misleading. Well, they must have been. Clearly, they seem to have misled plenty of law professors and judges since then. Why do you think he wrote them the way he did? Well, your guess is as good as mine. I had good reason to trust Davis's judgment. Years before, he had been my boss in an international court in Geneva where we won a lot of money from the British for their support of the Confederacy during our Civil War. Well, how much? About $15 million. That's about $250 million today, and it's how I came to national attention. Maybe I should have watched Davis more carefully, but I was so confoundedly busy with cases, and his credentials were impeccable. A genuine member of the American establishment. Of course. I was the son of a governor, brother of a congressman, Harvard College graduate, lawyer, journalist. I once interviewed Karl Marx. I was a diplomat, state legislator, railroad president, and related by marriage to a signer of the Constitution, a true citizen. Yes, he was. Th though now that you mention it, I had some complaints about his accuracy. For example? Well, let me see. Seems I remember a commercial publisher of Supreme Court proceedings was worried about his reputation because of discrepancies between Davis's official records and their records, and they stood by their own records. Anything else? Well, there were several cases missing from the official court records. Uh, the Senate complained about it. I started to look into that, but shed the mortal coil before I got very far. Several cases. There were 250 cases missing. <laughs> All right, but there still is another piece of this big puzzle. Why the huge change in Supreme Court sentiment? Sir? Well, in 1880, you were telling us officially in a written court decision that the Constitution did not mean to restrain states in the regulation of corporations. Just six years later, you all tell us unofficially in the Santa Clara headnote that corporations have 14th Amendment personhood protections. What really happened? 
And before you answer, let me tell you that some modern scholars think it was Roscoe Conkling who turned you around. They're still talking about Roscoe Conkling? Why not? I was a lawyer, congressman, senator, two-time Supreme Court nominee, Republican Party leader. What's not to talk about? You remember the case I argued in 1882? San Mateo County versus Southern Pacific Railroad Company. Right. The case was a lot like Santa Clara. Remarkably, I was a surviving member of the Congressional Committee that had drafted the 14th Amendment. Fancy that, a living authority and congressional intent. I argued that person also applied to the railroads. You remember my strategy. <laughs> How could I forget? During argument, you flourished that journal, calling it a journal of the drafting committee, and claimed that the committee had wavered back and forth in its wording, draft after draft, between person and citizen, finally choosing person as the word more potentially inclusive of corporations. A fine story, but it went for naught because the court made no decision. The case was rendered moot when the railroad went ahead and paid some of the taxes San Mateo claimed. It was so easy. There was nothing of that in that journal. But I had to get something into the record about the legal standing of corporations. Tell us honestly, Your Honor. Was it Conkling's version of history that turned your court around? I'd rather not say. Well, do you know that Conkling's story was a complete fraud? No, but I'm not surprised. Conkling was a bit of a rascal, and a rich rascal at that. Powerful, persuasive, charismatic. There was talk of his turning down the Supreme Court nominations because he could make more money staying in New York. Of course, you wouldn't know. The Conkling Journal disappeared for a long time but turned up in the 1930s when a Stanford Law Librarian examined it and found none of that switching back and forth between person and citizen. All drafts had used person. Congress had never meant to protect corporations under the 14th Amendment, not once. Do you know how much Southern Pacific paid Conkling for his performance? A lot. $10,000. The average annual wage at the time was about 500 and worth every single penny to Southern Pacific if the impact showed up four years later in the Santa Clara headnote. Judge Waite. I resent your implications, sir. No doubt about it. The railroads knew how to spend their huge Civil War profits to best advantage. They bought the very best lawyers with the very best connections, like Conkling, and they curried favor with the most important judges, such as you. No comment. Just wait. A man like you acquires many important papers in the course of his career. Many of yours are stored in the Library of Congress. My wife and I examined yours, dated 1884 through 1888, the year you died. Did you indeed? Sir, we did. And one thing we learned was how common it was for railroads to provide favors to you and other judges, even as you adjudicated railroad cases. For example, it was customary for railroads early each year to send you and other judges a free pass for that year. You were especially favored. When you took a long trip, you often had a private Pullman car at your disposal. And, of course, you left the travel details to your son, a railroad executive himself. What of it? These kinds of considerations are very common. Well, even in your own time, I should say. I've heard such talk recently about Justices Thomas and Scalia accepting favors from some Oklahoma tycoons, those Scotch brothers, big oil people, even a vice president. Cheney, I think it was. Of course, no one likes it, but it's a fact of life. When word got around, some citizens took it amiss. They complained about conflict of interest. Be that as it may, Congress put an end to the practice when it passed the Interstate Commerce Act in 1887. It was an era of reform, an end to corruption on the bench, supposedly. 
we got little notes from the railroads asking us to return our 1887 passes. Yes, we saw one of those among your papers. But let's go back one year to 1886, before your passes were revoked. In January 1886, you received at least three annual passes. That same month, in San you heard arguments in Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad Company. The decision came on May 10, 1886. On May 25, court reporter Davis wrote his note to you about 14th Amendment protections for corporations. Yes, that seems about right. During that same period, you and your daughter prepared for a trip to Alaska. Your son had been arranging free transportation with various railroads and steamship lines. One of the railroads was Southern Pacific. You and your daughter arrived in California in late August. Your host in San Francisco was Mr. Leland Stanford, former governor, U.S. Senator, president of the Southern Pacific Railroad. He extended every courtesy. He gave you letters addressed to his railroad employees, directing them to do all they could to make you and your daughter more comfortable in your travels. He even sent muskmelons grown on his ranch. Stanford arranged an excursion to Monterey for you and several California judges. You wrote a letter home on September 3 that described the excursion. You referred to a private railroad car and abundant Chinese servants everywhere you went, and there were other similar trips. We calculated that the cost of first-class travel alone was over twice the average annual wage, at least $1,000. Plus, the cost of these private cars, which often came with kitchen cook and a servant or two. Judge Waite, allowing that the times were different then, this practice was virtually like you justices receiving your own private jet planes fully staffed. All right. We did travel in comfort, but I never allowed any of that to affect my judicial decisions. Yes. Perhaps not. It's hard to tell, but it didn't look so good. It looked like conflict of interest at best, and graft at worst. And eventually, Congress did put an end to such things with the Interstate Commerce Act. So they did. Let's talk about one of your fellow Supreme Court justices, Stephen Field. Oh, must we? I know you loathed each other. But I need to tell you some things you don't know about the man. Oh, I think I know enough. Now, there was a genuine railroad lackey. We were all favorable to the railroads. Most of us have been railroad lawyers. But Field was a complete lickspittal. He was always after me to let him write ever an opinion that touched on railroad matters. Everything. I finally had to take him aside and explain how bad it would look for him to write an opinion that dealt directly with his personal railroad friends. The man had no shame at all when it came to railroads, and everybody knew he was in their pocket. Judge Waite, you have no idea. He did his worst in 1889, the year after you died. It was another railroad case, Minneapolis and St. Louis Railway Company versus Beckwith. The court actually ruled against the railroad, saying, you railroad guys owe Mr. Beckwith some money because your locomotive killed three of his hogs, plus punitive damages to the state of Iowa. The case has nothing to do with corporate personhood, but Field is writing the majority opinion. And guess what he does? He throws in a completely gratuitous citation of Santa Clara as a precedent for corporate personhood. Yes, I was vexed that Waite hadn't allowed it in the Santa Clara case. But I knew that a first, a first citation in a majority opinion made it official. Stare decisis. That's Latin. I also knew full well that Santa Clara presented no such decision, that the railroad rights reference was in the head note, not the opinion. Huh. So how could I say that? <laughs> For one thing, I was there. 
just as were other concurring justices. Santa Clara should have settled the constitutional issue, but it didn't. Minneapolis and St. Louis did. Humbug. I have to agree with you. I would never have thought a Supreme Court justice would think that low, not even Field, completely reprehensible. But Field was not alone. Sitting with Field on the same court that disposed of Beckwith's hogs were six fellow veterans of the Santa Clara court, Miller, Bradley, Harlan, Matthews, Gray, and Blatchford. My God, what a dark day for the Supreme Court of the United States. You know, Justice Waite, you know, it almost seems that had you been there, maybe you could have kept them on the straight and narrow. As God is my witness, yes, I do hope so. What were Field and his colleagues after that drove them to such an extreme? They weren't destitute men. They had no pressing debts that I know of. It's hard to fully comprehend that level of corruption. I think it had to be more than money. Maybe money, ideology, and fear. Field was no intellectual, but he had a friend who was. My name is John Norton Pomeroy. I was a professor at Hastings Law School in San Francisco. I helped Field with briefs and knew Conkling had put the argument for corporate personhood before the court. Even though I knew corporations were not intended to have constitutional rights, I supported Field's obsessive pressure for it. The railroads needed the protection. Money, ideology, fear, even one can move mountains. Think what you can do with all three plus a little luck. Seems like that's a lesson for your time as well. Enough greed and ideology and fear to go around, huh? Mr. Chief Justice, do you have any advice for the Roberts Court, for the five justices who gave us Citizens United in 2010? I do. Stop using our Santa Clara ruling as a decision on corporate personhood or any of its constitutional protections. Read the full decision, not just the headnote. My comment about the 14th Amendment was only a remark in passing, which they know very well is not the same as an opinion. One reason we made no constitutional ruling on 14th Amendment protections for railroads is that we could not construct a rationale. We were up against seven or eight decades of case law that drew a clear distinction between natural persons and artificial creations of the government. Constitutional protections were for the former and not for the latter. Government could regulate corporations in any way it pleased because corporations were the creatures of government. They had no natural rights, unlike people who enjoyed the natural rights guaranteed by the Constitution. I could never imagine a plausible rationale for overturning those decades of well-reasoned case law, and neither could anyone else. You must understand. The United States Supreme Court is not supposed to issue dictates unaccompanied by sound legal argument, but apparently it did in 1889. It did something much worse than that. It pretended that our 1886 court had offered a sound legal rationale for corporate personhood. It's despicable. Unforgivable! I am glad that I was not there to witness it. For the Roberts Court to claim any precedent for corporate personhood protections is to sign up with Field and his gang of 1889. How can they claim our respect unless they mend their ways? Do they think any branch of government can function as it should without the respect of those it governs? Let the members of the judiciary branch say, shame! on us. Let them turn their hands to the reversal of this damnable error and let them do it now. That is my advice to the Roberts Court. And just one more thing. To the Roberts Court and every other court, 
Next time some mogul invites you to the Bohemian Grove, next time some potentate offers a ride in his private jet for a weekend of duck hunting with his friends at his lodge, think twice. Above all, think why me? I thank you. I came here today to hold you to account for the travesty of justice that has corrupted our courts usurped the rights of the American people, drowned out our voices, and now threatens our republic and its democratic institutions. But now, I find I must thank you. Your honorable example restores some hope that the court can be worthy of our founders and one that serves the people. Chief Justice Waite now understands, and so do you, how he was used by corporate personhood schemers railroad men who literally railroaded the court and our democracy.